Good morning, everyone. Well, I guess I'm starting without the praise band being. Okay. Well, it's good to see all of you here today. I do want to make one mention this series that we're going through, the Essential 100. We have a couple of resources if you want them. If you go out into the foyer immediately to the left, one is a, a daily reading plan, and you can see what I'm preaching on. It has a little punch card for you to keep track of. And the other one is a sermon series notebook where you can just take notes, and there's a place for the key question, the key idea. And so these are out in the foyer if you want them. So I guess we're ready uh, to get going. Rich, you, you guys ready? All right. We're a little thin today, but that's that's okay. The frozen chosen. Yeah, thin. All right. Well, let's stand and sing. just in case anybody ever wondered, wondered if like document redaction and things like that were just in, uh, you know, when they take things out and they don't let you see it, we, we have some redacted documents up here too, so it's... <laughs> okay. Just chords we don't want to play. Thank you. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are the ruler of all. Lord, we come here today with different things on our hearts and in our minds. And Lord, we just submit those to you right here, right now. Lord, I pray that you help us understand your word, your will, and your way. And so, Lord, today, make that happen. Lord, we want to follow you. And so, Lord, we submit to you our whole being right here. And so, Lord, come join us today in this place at this hour. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. You see the prayer concerns that are listed in the bulletin. I want to add Richard Hem. Uh, we've been praying for Richard off and on, uh, but his health is, is failing quickly, so we need to make sure and pray for him. Are there any other prayer concerns? That's good. It's a quiet week then. All right. Okay, so Taylor McLeland has a severe fracture. I need to pray for healing. Uh, Pastor Dave, we've been praying for. Uh, he went uh, from the Good Sam to the hospital in the ICU. And they ori first originally believed that it was pneumonia, but it was, they found out it wasn't pneumonia and that it was probably just dehydration. And so he has, um, he's still in the hospital, but they're looking to try to release him and try to figure out where he's supposed to be, whether he goes back to Good Sam or does rehab at the hospital. So um, anyway, he's doing better. Anything else to add, Rich? Okay. All right, any other prayer concerns? All right, well, let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today. Lord, we set aside this time that we may meet you here. And so, Lord, continue to speak to us. Reveal your will, will to each one of us. And, Lord, in return, let us be faithful servants for you. Lord, we have all these names on the list. Most of them we know, some we don't. But Lord, we humbly give them to you today, right, right now. And Lord, we pray for those that are going into surgery, calm their nerves, give them a peace. And Lord, prepare the way before them. And for those that are coming out of surgery, and uh, we just pray for healing for them. Lord, let it be just total healing and exactly what they needed. Lord, we also remember those families that have lost loved ones and our heart aches for them. And Lord, we just ask that, that you intervene and Lord, provide comfort for them. And Lord, for any of these names or anyone in need around us, Lord, I just pray that you put it on our heart. Maybe we're the answer to someone's prayer. And so, Lord, if, if we could help someone we know or someone on this list, Lord, we just uh, ask that you reveal that to us. Lord, if we're sending cards, Lord, I pray that we may be an encouragement. And Lord, I just ask um, that you may use us as an instrument of your peace. And so, Lord, we give you all of these things. We remember our great nation and we pray for the change in leadership. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that ultimately that your will be done. And so, Lord, we give these things to you right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I want to ask if you have tithes and offerings, you can place them in the box at the back. Um, and then I'll release the, the children.
Um, and the children can meet Michelle Albert in the back, preschool through sixth grade. You can go with Michelle. And I'll say a blessing for the children as they make their way there. All right, I'll say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of these kiddos for entrusting us with them. Lord, we pray for their ongoing safety, not just today, but when they leave from here. Lord, we just ask that they may feel your love, grace, and mercy at some point today and this week. And Lord, just be with them. Lord, we pray for Michelle too. Uh, Lord, let her uh, just exude your love. And uh, Lord, uh, to provide teaching that they need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. invite you to take out your Bible and to turn with me to John 18. I'm going to read from 28 uh, to verse 40. So John 28 to verse 40. My Bible entitles this section of scripture, Jesus before Pilate. Everybody turn and look, you get to see a brand new baby up there. Do you like it when I draw attention to you? Don't tell me you were about to feed her or anything. Oh, okay. Ooh, that would have been awkward. That's baby Lydia. Yep, so um, it looks like she's excited to be here. Congratulations, by the way. Okay, that was my squirrel moment for the day or hour. I'm going to read John 18. Verse 28 and on. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against man? They answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom's not of this world, and my kingdom were if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting. So I would not be handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he said to him, he went out against to, to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. That was God's word for us today. 
So in this church, we have been playing this video for a long time. Dave played it, I've played it, and it's one of our church's favorite videos, and it's worth replaying again. And so this is a video uh, by uh, a Southern Baptist preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge. He preached a sermon based on the, the sevenfold kingship of Jesus. Uh, and this is a video and a sermon, his actual sermon entitled, uh, That's My King. So here, here it is. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a no way of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Could you imagine hearing that live? It gets you fired up, ready to, to storm the gates of hell with a squirt gun, huh? He delivers that magnificently, doesn't he? Um, and he starts out describing Jesus as king, right? And, and that's the whole purpose of what he's doing there. King of the Jews, King of Israel, King of righteousness, King of the ages, King of heaven, King of glory. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my king. You see, when Pilate was 
uh, when Jesus was brought before Pilate, ultimately they were trying to, to find him guilty of something. And that's ultimately what Pilate was going after, was that he was claiming to be a king when in the Roman Empire you had to be appointed to be a king and he hadn't been appointed so they could find him guilty. And so you'll see that angle. Now, now this sermon and this scripture that I'm, I'm preaching on, you could come from about seven, seven different ways. Um, and, and I could be preaching on this for the next seven Sundays if I really wanted to. There's so many different angles that I could take. But I, I'm looking at Pilate's interaction with Jesus a little more in depth in understanding Jesus as a king. Now, John wrote this book. I always recommend to new Christians, if you're going to start reading scripture, to start with the book of James. James is an easy read. It's kind of a nuts and bolts Christianity is the way I describe it. And then the book of John is, is theologically rich. And you're not going to perfectly understand the book of John, but John's aim in writing this book was so that you understood exactly who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah and ultimately he is our king. And so the key question is, is Jesus a king? The key idea, if this is all you remember, remember this, Jesus is indeed a king above all kings of a kingdom not of this world. He states very clearly that he was a king and not of this world. And so this is where Jesus answered in John chapter 18. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. So I want to remind you that when Jesus was talking about being a Messiah, the Jewish people believed that the Messiah was going to come in and restore Israel as a nation. They had been exiled. They had been separated from their land and from their culture. And they were, they were being brought in. And they thought that this Messiah was going to be a political leader riding in on a white horse and, and restoring the nation physically on this earth. And they were going to do it with might. And in, in the Bible, oftentimes they would, they would talk about zealots, these, these disciples, these people that, that were zealous about, about making this happen. And so that, that's kind of an undercurrent to this. And so this, I, I traded sermons. The one I'm preaching on next week actually comes before this one, but it was talking about the Passover meal and the introduction of communion and why we celebrate communion. And so this particular passage, I swapped it because we'll take communion next week. And so uh, just keep in mind, so they were taking this Passover meal, they leave and, and in the Passover meal, Jesus talks about Judas is going to betray him. He foretells that. And he says, oh, by the way, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And this, and keep in mind, Peter was the rock. Peter was the one that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church upon you as the foundation. And, um, and so all of this comes in. So they leave eating the meal and they come in and they're, this is where they're at. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over to the ravine of the Kidron. So Jerusalem's a walled city, and this was on past the wall east of the city of Jerusalem. And it was on this in this ravine. And they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, but Gethsemane means oil press. And so it wasn't a garden like you and I would think, where it's lined with tulips and marigolds and has some carrots and lettuce and radishes. No, it, it was more of an olive tree orchard. And so that's where they went. And so they entered this garden. And now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. 
And Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. They come to do business. Judas was taking them there to arrest Jesus. Now, other accounts, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's known as the synoptic gospels because they tell a lot of the same stories. They tell different ones, but they tell different accounts of the same one. And so this one, um, he leaves out the part that Judas identifies him with a kiss. And so other gospels talk about they, that he gives away Jesus by, by kissing him on the cheek. Um, and so here, the temple officers, the temple people, brought in a commander and his troops, all loaded with weapons, all for a man that they said identified himself as a king. They were worried he was going to be a revolutionary, and they weren't sure how many followers he had. So they brought their entire army for uh, Jesus and his 12 disciples. And so they showed up. And so Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? Jesus knew they were there for him. And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. It's interesting, Jesus was from Nazareth, and that's who they identified him as, very specifically who he was. And he said to them, I am he. That's an interesting way to answer, that's me. You know, he said, I am he. There's a reason for that. Some people that try to refute Jesus, try to refute that he was God, says, well, Jesus never said he was God. And that's true. Jesus never told people, hello, I am God. Instead, he used phrases like this, I am he. In the Old Testament, when people asked, who should I say I just met when they met God? He'd say, I am, I am the great I am, I am. So Jewish people knew that I am is God. And so here he says, I am he. And uh, Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, listen to what happened. They drew back and fell to the ground. I've always said there's power in Jesus' name. Even when he says, I am he, there's great power. And they drew back and they fell. Therefore, he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, then let these go on their way. That was pretty noble of Jesus. He had all of his disciples there. And he said, if you're looking for me, then take me. But leave my disciples alone. Let them go on their way. And so that's what they did. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. This is what he said. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. So under his care, they all survived. Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. Peter being Peter, he had a lot of fervor and a lot of fight in him. And when they were going to arrest Jesus, he thought he was going to maybe usher in the revolution. That's a possibility. But he cut off his ear. Now, another part of, of the testimonies was that Jesus healed that ear. You would remember that, wouldn't you? And so Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? In other places in the Gospels, Jesus would do something miraculous, and then he would say, now don't tell anyone, the hour is not yet here. Don't tell anyone. Yeah, right, if you're going to do, if I'm witnessing a miracle, everyone's going to know it, right? Right? 
and he, but he didn't want it to come too quick. He had ministry. He had a message to get out. And so now he was telling Peter, whoa, remember I was telling you to wait? Now is that time. And so they, uh, the time had ushered in. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first. Now Annas was uh, a temple official. He was high up there. He had power, he had might, and, and he also had greed. And one interesting thing in the temple, they built in nepotism. You know what that is? Where you hire your family, you hire your family in. The way I chose to be a pastor was I felt a calling from God. I felt like out of all the things I could do on this earth, that's what God told me to do. And, and so he called me out of manufacturing and said, here, I want you to be a pastor and to preach and teach. Then you just happened to be a relative of the high priest. And that's how you became a priest. Very, very dangerous, isn't it? And so Annas was this high official. I, I, two or three of his sons were also in the priest line. And then his son-in-law was a man by the name of Caiaphas. And so we'll be introduced to Caiaphas. And so they first took him to this Annas. And he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews. Remember last week? He said, wouldn't it be expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people? He, he was telling them, hey, if Jesus is the revolutionary, if we kill him, then everything will be good. We'll still have the, the peace that Rome brings us. And that's what we desire a lot. And so let's just get rid of one man. We'll save the whole nation. When in reality... That was accidentally, theologically correct. One man died, Jesus, for all of us so that we may live in heaven. So he was accidentally correct, this Caiaphas. And that's who said that. And so Simon Peter was following Jesus and so was another disciple. John, when he writes his book, it's interesting. He names names, right? He, he's very precise. But oftentimes in his stories, he'll refer to another disciple or the beloved disciple. And a lot of people believe that it's him, that he's the other disciple. And so it was Simon Peter, who goes by Peter, and then this other disciple, and if you look back on Jesus' teachings, he, he ministered to 72. The Bible doesn't name the 72. But then he would minister to the 12, the 12 disciples. And then he would often minister to three disciples. If they were alone, if he was alone with three disciples, I guess he wouldn't be alone, would he? If he was there with three disciples, it was often Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. And, and Jesus poured into those three more than others. And then within the, those three, he was often teaching and expecting more out of Peter. And so here, Peter and probably John um, were together. And it was interesting because the other disciple knew the high priest. So they, they go up to this house and they're trying to figure out how to get in. And John's like, well... I know how to get in. I know the guy. So they let him in. And when they go in, the, the slave girl that had opened the door ushered Peter in and says, you're not also one of the this man's disciples, are you? And Peter, the bold one, the one who had cut the ear off of the man in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, I'm not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was also with them, standing and warming themselves. So imagine this building with a courtyard in the center, and they had a fire in the center. And anybody who wasn't meeting 
with, with the other officials where they were trying to stay warm. And so that's where Peter and, and the other disciple decided to, to stand and wait to find out what was going to happen with Jesus. And the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. You listen, they, were, they wanted to know um, specifically about his disciples. How many followers exactly do you have? How big is your army, right? And then tell me about your teachings. What exactly were you teaching them? And so Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple. He was saying, this wasn't some closed society that I was teaching them. Um, everybody heard what I was teaching them. And I spoke nothing in secret. So why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. So here's why he said that was the judges of the time. If you're going to get a fair trial, the judge wouldn't ask questions. The judge would merely pull witnesses to either testify for or against whoever was being charged. And so here he was. And he was saying, listen, there's a lot of witnesses that have heard and seen what I've done. Why don't you call those witnesses? He was saying, call an official trial here and call the witnesses like you're supposed to do. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by nearby struck Jesus, saying, Is this the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if I'm speaking rightly, why do you strike me? And so uh, this particular guard uh, or soldier thought it was insolence. He thought he was, he was speaking against the high priest. He thought he was insulting him. And so Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Keep in mind, these trials are within the temple, within the, the, the religious sector, right? So in a lot of ways, the way John wrote this was like, like a movie scene, right? Uh, he would show one scene of Jesus being tried, and then he would come over here and the next scene would be of what's happening with Peter. And they would, he would go back and forth between Jesus and Peter and Jesus and Peter. So he, he had gone to Peter, he went back to Jesus, and now he's with Peter again. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being relative of the one who cut off, uh, Peter cut his ear off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? If it's your cousin who's getting his ear cut off and you witness it, you would remember clearly who did it, right? And so Peter denied it again. Strike three. And immediately a rooster crowed. Exactly the way Jesus said when they were eating that Passover meal. They, they said, he said, oh, and Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And at the third time, a rooster's going to crow. Peter had to have heard that rooster and just sink internally, right? And so there it was. Now, do you hear the contrast between Jesus and Peter? Listen to this contrast. John makes this theological point. Jesus stands up to his questioners and denies nothing. Jesus' life is on the line. All he has to do is say, I didn't say that. I'm not, you know, I'm not a king. Uh, and I'm no threat, right? But instead, he denies nothing. And Peter cowers and denies everything to a group around a fire. They were after Jesus, not after Peter, and yet Peter feared for his life, and Peter cowered. And that's unlike Peter, but he did. So now the scene flashes back to Jesus, and he stands before Pilate. 
Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So this is Passover time. It's we it's it's the Thursday before Easter. So the Passover happens, and then Jesus dies on the cross, and then he rises on Sunday, right? And so they in the Jewish sense, they were celebrating Passover. That's all they celebrated. And there was a meal after the Passover meal. And if they went into a Gentile's house, they would defile themselves. It was just according to the Jewish laws. And so they wouldn't have been able to celebrate this, this meal after Passover. So that's why they chose not to go into his house. Instead, he came out to speak to them. And Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would have not delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. So if there's a dispute within the church, we go within the church to settle it, right? If someone has a dispute with the church and they take it to a court, the first thing chances are the judge will say is, did you try to handle it within your ecclesiastical body, within the church first? And that's what he was doing. Did you handle it in the church? And they tried with Caiaphas and Annas. And the Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. You notice, that isn't what he asked them. He asked them, did you settle it within the church? And they said, well, we're not allowed to put anyone to death. I don't think that was part of the question. But that's what they wanted. They wanted a conviction so that he could be killed and do away with this revolutionary, right? And so here is what they're putting before Pilate, who, who now is out of the church, and he is, he is the, the most powerful person in their area. And so in verse 33, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? He was saying, I didn't come in here telling you that I was the king of the Jews. So either you know that, or you heard it from someone. And they knew, Jesus knew where they had heard it, that the religious leaders had told him. And so Pilate answered, well, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Saying, why are they so angry with you? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I would be, not be handed over to the Jews. Remember what I said. They thought the Messiah was going to come in and overthrow the government. And then Israel would have their nation back. But that isn't what Jesus said. He said, my kingdom, the kingdom that I'm establishing, is not of this world. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? And he said, if my kingdom was here, everybody would be fighting to defend me. And you notice they're not doing that. My kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. He's saying, that is your words, not mine. For, I've, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who hears is of the truth, who hears my voice. Jesus just answered, and many of you say, well, why does Jesus come 
to earth? And he answers it right there, to testify to the truth. And so what's your first question? It's the same question as Pilate's. Pilate said to him, what is truth? That is a profoundly deep question. What is truth? You know, it's a, it's a fallacy to try to give a new definition to a word. And so in this, Jesus is saying truth is absolute. Truth is from God. Truth is what I say and what I do. If we want to know what the truth of life is, we look to what Jesus said and did. We look for, in my Bible, he spoke and they printed in red words. We look at the red words and we see what Jesus said and what he did. And that's what we know is the truth, everything that he taught. In today's society, we say truth is relative. Your truth is okay. Well, that's great because I'm an ax murderer. I'm glad you believe what I do is right. Do you follow that? Maybe not. That's a deeper thing. Truth. We say the truth isn't relative, that there is one truth, and that truth comes from Scripture and truth comes from God, that it doesn't, and it's not held to our own definitions. And so when Pilate said, uh, what is truth? He was, he was genuinely asking, you're talking about it, but I don't really know what it is. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. What an interesting custom. They release one prisoner during Passover. And so here it was, says, um, do you wish for me to release the king of the Jews? But they cried out saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And so here was Jesus, the innocent man who had three incorrect trials and was not really found guilty of anything, should have been released, right? But instead they said to release Barabbas. And it says, now Barabbas was a robber. Now, if you look at the Greek word for robber, it means a violent man who robs people. Well, that's interesting. It's not just someone who robs, but it's a violent man. Some versions translate all of that as a revolutionary. So the things they thought Jesus was, Barabbas actually was, and they released him. Well, there you go. What does that have to do with us? What a story. That is the passion story. It's leading up to Easter. We're celebrating Easter early, apparently, I guess. So here's some lessons I want you to think about. First of all, he had three shams of trials. No witnesses were called. He was never found guilty and ultimately condemned to death. So no justice for Jesus prevailed. The second thing was there was a religious corruption happening. This nepotism that I talk about, hiring family up into the church, not because they were called to serve God, but because it supplied their needs. The religious corruption, they felt like Jesus was overtaking their authority and their knowledge. After all, I don't know if you remember this, but it's one of my favorite lines in scriptures. He, he had gone in and, he, and Jesus had been teaching in the synagogues. And one of the kind of the footnotes, someone, or they recorded that, and Jesus taught like nobody else had. Well, you, you have a great teacher come into the synagogue and it's going to offend the religious leaders. The third thing is John wrote this with the kingship of Jesus in mind. A pilot referred to, if you go back and read chapter 18 and what comes after this is chapter 19. You like how I can count like that? 18, 19. Both of them 
uh, circled the word king. And John weaves that into the scripture to, to get into our mind that, that Jesus was a king and that he has authority over us. And then the last thing is Peter's denials. I always describe uh, scripture with one word, the word redemption. You can pick out any story of the Bible and there's a story of redemption in it. I should say almost any story, the story of redemption in it. And Peter is no less. He is a story of the redemptive power of Christ. And so here he failed Jesus miserably by not standing up for him and, and, and proclaiming what he proclaimed. And he denied Jesus. But we'll get to the story later about him, how Jesus reinstated Peter and, and gave him that redemption to become this leader of the church that we needed him to be. Here's a quote for you. I want you to think about this. God will accomplish his purposes reveal his glory despite what is happening in the world. Sometimes we get so caught up in the intricacies of, of government and of this world, and we could take any angle we want on it, whether what's happening in Washington or in our own state department or, or in some other country, and we can convince ourselves where, where is God. But in reality, his will will be done. And God will accomplish his purposes and reveal his glory despite everything in the world. Because his world is not of this kingdom. My king is in heaven. Now, what can you do with Jesus. Imagine your pilot and he comes before you. You can be like Pilate or like Annas and Caiaphas and avoid the whole hassle of Jesus. Right? He he come in and he disrupted their their early evening and they avoided the hassle of dealing with him. The second thing is when Jesus testified when he said that he testified to the truth, Pilate simply asked, what is truth? He didn't dig into, what are you talking about? He could dig, we could dig into the truth about Jesus. Or we could accept him as the source of truth and listen to him. I had a typo there, sorry. We could listen to him. So let me leave you with this. How now shall I live? The question that is begged is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Ultimately, he's standing before you. And at some point, everybody has to decide what to do with this man, Jesus. What will you decide? Will you say, yes, I want to follow you. I want to dig into your truth. I want to accept. I want to follow you. I want to go all in. Or are you going to say, like Pilate, no. And if you say, ah, oh, I'm not ready to decide, then that is deciding, right? Either you say yes to following him. Or no. I'm going to tell you, I think I was about 24 years old when I decided to follow Jesus. And my life was changed. It's, some people are saying, oh, I, I don't want anything to do with him. If, he's a, if he'll disrupt anything in my life, I don't want anything about it. But I'm telling you, it was the single greatest decision of my life to start following Jesus, to dig into his truths and his teachings so that I could say yes to him. And I have no doubts that someday I'll be seeing the king 
in his kingdom, which is not of this world, which is not of this realm, but it's in heaven. I want to invite the band to come up. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation. We leave this time open. If you want me to pray with you, maybe you've never accepted Christ, said, yes, I want to follow him. I've never even tried to learn more about him. You can come talk with me. Let me pray with you. Or maybe you need prayer for something else, something near and dear to you. You and I can pray. Let's stand and, and sing our hymn of invitation. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the redemption in our life, the forgiveness of our sins. And so, Lord, I just ask, Lord, uh, help us live in your, in the kingdom here. We know that we're not yet to the kingdom of heaven. And so, Lord, while we're here, let us search for you and seek your truth. And, Lord, to live a life worthy of the calling that you've put on each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there, I have some announcements for you. We've started up Sunday school, though some of the adults, uh, the, we had COVID go around a little bit, and so Don Brain was out and didn't have his class. Um, I've got a class going. I think we're going to move to the library um, where I'm talking about uh, worldviews. Um, and the Christian worldview compared to others. And, and then we'll work into developing our own worldview. Um, and then Harold and Gina has a class upstairs, um, the Red Sea class. And so um, you can go to that one. And then Don will have one down in the, the fellowship area. And then uh, Wednesdays we have uh, JAM, which is our elementary ministry starts with a meal at 6 and then goes into a lesson until 7.15. Middle school meets at that same time and then high school we meet uh, later. We meet at 6.30 for a meal and then we have a lesson. We go over to our house uh, after that. And so if you're interested in those, uh, please take note. It's in your bulletin. Well, it's good to um, worship with you today. Uh, get your snow shovels uh, sharpened up tonight. And uh, if you need some extra work, you can stop by my house. And, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and so anyway, uh, Dickie said at the first service, I believe it when I see it. We still have apple pie filling or apple filling left. 
Okay. So the, the, the preschool uh, had made apples that are ready to be put into pie or whatever it may be, cobbler, whatever. And so if you want to buy a bag of those apples that are frozen, uh, see Dawn and then the corn bags to, to heat up uh, to put on your sore parts of your body. Is that a good way to put it, I guess? I don't know. You can freeze them. Oh, or freeze them. So anyway, um, those are for sale still as well. And all the proceeds go to uh, the preschool. Well, with that, let's sing our, our closing song. What is our closing song? I'll fly away. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Just a few more years.